Chapter 22 on page 170. I needed some time to think about my new idea before I did anything about it. For days I had popped one problem to another like a pumpkin seed on a griddle and I was tired of it. Just weeks ago I'd begun to hunger for change, impatient with my life, much as I loved it. Somewhere excitement waited for me like an uncut cake. Now I wanted nothing more than to be still, thoughtful, and quiet for just a little while. The turtle stone was not far from the schoolhouse. Deer traveling the path of the wolf hollow had beaten other narrow trails that led from the fern beds they loved. I took the first of these, once again grateful that Betty was not waiting for me. I wondered if I should feel guilty about that, but I didn't. I could have hurried more to find her, but I hadn't put her down that well. She'd done that all by herself. I was truly alone. My brothers were long gone, and all the birds and small animals were hiding in plain sight, waiting to discover my intentions. I had none. The turtle stone sat in the center of the clearing like a great moon in a galaxy of yellow maple stars. It was a beautiful thing, the quartz veins running deep and clear through its hard, reddish shell. We had long wondered about it, where it had come from, why it was the only one of its kind in these hills. I'd been angry about a lot of Betty's nastiness, but when I saw the scars she'd made on the stone and remembered the reason for them, real fury overcame me. My hand ran over the stone, expecting some suggestion of softness. Instead, the stone itself told me a thing or two about age and resilience, and the trees at the edge of the clearing quietly concurred. Who was I to worry about a stone that had been there since long before any of us, that would be here long after we were all gone? I had come here to consider serious matters and how I might figure in the scheme of things, important things. Instead, the stone made me aware for the first time that my life, however long, would amount to nothing more than a flicker. Not even that. Not even a flicker. Not even a sigh. As I made my way back through the woods, I thought of the men who had dug pits close by here. Maybe boys, too. Not much older than I was right now. I imagine those pits, the wolves trapped in them, snarling and whining for release, the bones they'd left behind the unborn pups, their rose petal ears. I imagined, I thought about Betty and her gone father and why she had intended Toby such harm, the awful stories he told me and the terrible softness of his scars, and I decided that there might be things I would never understand, no matter how hard I tried, though try, I would. And that there would be people who would never hear my one small voice, no matter what I had to say. But then a better thought occurred, and this was the one I carried away with me that day. In my, if my life was to be just a single note in an endless symphony, how could I not sound it out for as long and as loudly as I could? When I got home, I found my mother and my grandmother in the sitting room, their laps full of mending. I said my hellos. Where are the boys? In the haymo with Jordan, my mother said, giving me a look. I kept my jaw from dropping with Jordan, my grandmother said her eyes on her work. Such a nice man to stay on and help your father patch up the barn. Can I go help too? I asked. Yeah, for a while, my mother said. Bring your brothers back with you when you come. Did you give Jordan some lunch? At which my mother looked up smiling. No, Annabelle, your father asked him to help in the haymow all day, but we didn't invite him in at lunchtime. My grandmother chuckled. I was just asking. I said, and I was just telling, my mother replied. Now get out there so you can get back here to help with supper. I followed the sound of hammering and boy holler out to the barn. At the big upper doors to the threshing floor, I found my father and Toby patching a gapped tooth wall 
while my brother swung to and fro from a knotted rope. I guess it was jealousy I felt at the sight of them carrying on so well and easily without me. What kept you? My father said. The boys have been here a half an hour or more. I spent some time at the turtle stone, I said. My father and Toby looked at me like the horses did when I disturbed their grazing. It's quiet there, I said, which seemed to satisfy them both. <clears throat> I looked over my shoulder at the boys who were making more noise than crows over a hawk. Did you hide the stuff up in the loft? My father nodded. I buried the hair in the woods. We wrapped the guns in Toby's coat and stuck them under a bale of hay and bedding too the cameras in his hat behind the bales, and I told the boys to stay out of the loft. Which was the most alarming thing he might have said. Telling the boys not to do something was like giving a steak to a dog and telling him not to eat it. I have an idea, I said. It amazed me when these two grown men put down their hammers at my four little words. Let's, let's step outside, my father said. Toby and I followed him through the big side doors. What idea! I thought back for a moment to the thread that I'd followed at the schoolhouse and the decision I'd made at the Turtle Stone to use that thread to mend what I could. I think I know how to get Andy to admit that you're innocent, Toby, I said. They waited. Andy and Betty saw you above them on the hill that day. They saw you up there with a the camera. So? So we just tell Andy that you took a picture of Betty throwing the rock. Toby shook his head. But I didn't. It happened too fast. And then they ducked back into the bushes. And all I got was a shot in the road down below. You and Ruth, who was hurt. We know that, Toby, my father said. We saw the picture. It made you look guilty. But Andy doesn't know that. He just knows you were up there on the hill with a camera. We'll tell him the pictures came back and one of them shows Betty throwing the rock. And if he thinks he's been caught in the biggest lie, he has no reason to lie about the rest of it. And you had no reason to push Betty down that well, I said to Toby. We need to go talk to Andy as soon as we can, I said to my father. Take the constable with us so he can hear for himself what really happened. And that's when the boys scattered our best laid schemes like a fistful of bird seed. We all turned as they raced out of the barn toward us. Look what we found, they cried. James held a black hat high in his fist. Henry, a camera. We stared at them speechless. Toby's been in our barn, Henry said. Maybe he's still around, hiding, and suddenly lowered his voice. Maybe he's still in the barn somewhere. Daddy, Daddy, do you think he's still in the barn? What were we supposed to say? We couldn't tell them that Toby was standing right in front of them. The boys were blabbermouths. And we couldn't tell them not to say anything about what they'd found. They would see no earthly reason to keep such information from the police when there was a manhunt going on, whether, whether they liked Toby or not. Where did you get those? My father asked. In the loft, James said, dancing in place, behind some bales. Why would Toby leave his hat, his camera, in our loft? Henry said, doesn't make any sense, unless he's still around here somewhere. How about we let the constable worry about that, my father said, taking the camera out of Henry's hands. Now, go on back to the house and wash up. But get going, he said, relieving James of the hat. We'll be along in a minute. James made a face. How come she doesn't have to go? She'll be right behind you. Now get. We watched the boys stomp away down the lane. Toby took off his gloves and rubbed his bad hand. This isn't good, my father said. I should go, Toby said. We need to get over the wood berries quick, I said. Annabelle, this is starting to feel like a mare's nest, my father said. 
I think we should tell everything to the constable and let him deal with Andy. And, and if that doesn't work, we spent a moment and thought, um, I suppose we can stay, you can stay in hiding, Toby, while we try it, my father said. If Andy doesn't fess up, you can take off and walk straight into a manhunt, I said. Toby shrugged. I walk quietly. You're not walking anywhere yet, my father said. What harm would it do to talk to Andy, I said. We can go right now and tell him there's a picture of him and Betty on the hill when Ruth got hurt and see what he does. Which will mean trouble for you if he doesn't confess, Toby said. You'll be telling lies to get him to tell the truth. People will wonder why. Let them wonder, my father says. We've defended you all along. It's not a stretch to think we still might try to help you out. Which raises the question, Toby said slowly, why did you defend me all along? My father tipped his head in silence. Because you didn't do anything wrong, he said. Toby considered that for a moment, rubbing his scars, and I heard his stories budding at their lids. When Toby finally straightened up and took his hat, out of my father's hands. I knew what was coming. Thank you for what you've done. He said it mostly to me, though he avoided my eyes, but this is a game I don't want to play anymore. He put his hat on. Instantly, Jordan was no more. What, what are you going to do? I said, following him into the barn. He didn't answer me, nor did he answer my father, who always asked him to stay until we who asked him to stay until we could clear things up. He didn't seem to hear us as he climbed the ladder to the loft. That man's so stubborn he could be a member of this family, I said, from your mother's side, my father said. We watched as Toby climb back down in his long black coat, his guns again slung across his back. Toby! You can't just go off like this, I said. It's not a game. But he simply paused for a moment to hand my grandfather's coat to me and to give my father the gloves he'd been wearing. You're really leaving, I said, just like that? But he didn't answer. It was hard to believe. After everything we've tried, but I realized that he truly meant to go. Your camera! My father said, holding it out to Toby, who refused it with a wave of his hand. What I could see of his face was as pale as I'd ever seen it. When he turned and left the barn, walked out across the back pasture, and disappeared into the woods.